prepared man, human beings, the animal kingdom, were many times, in many ways, a lot inferior. We don't have the strength as animals, many, many animals. We don't have the speed. We can't jump and climb. We can't fly, most of us. We can't hold our breath on the water like fish. But we are still superior with our brain. Because Baruch gave us all a brain, a Gavaldi Gematona. That's what differentiates us from human beings. The beloved Smith has been very happily offered to give a shear titled Making Good Decisions in All Times and Places. We use our brain and our heart to make decisions all the time, every moment, every moment of the day. There were many G'dayim. They had G'day Seket, Big Bobby Kishrin. They were very short. The Moshe Feinstein, Yankee Kalnetsky, the Baron Kotlin, the Tzadkin Rochman, Chazanish. Height doesn't necessarily show a person's intelligence, but sometimes you could measure a person's capabilities by the amount he charges per hour. It's a privilege for us and a great source to have a Dover, the Dover who's an attorney and uh, I'm sure you'll enjoy the share and find it very fascinating. Okay, thank you, Robert. Either. Um, if you have the chalk, it'll be, I can keep track of things on the board, it'd be helpful. So, the title is, uh, I don't know if I call it Shear. The opportunity to get to know each other and to really understand what we're here in the world for is making good decisions at all times and all places. Uh -huh. Because why you're sitting here in Masifta, and why you're sitting here in Yeshiva, is really to give yourself and to acquire the ability to be able to make good decisions. You're gonna be, you're right now, you're already in life, you see that you're among your classmates. When you're a little kid, you don't really have much choice. You already start to see that some of your peers that you grew up with, even family members, they're making different choices than you. So how do you know what choices to make? In fact, we are meant to make a choice every day. We're meant to make a choice when the first thing we wake up, we're meant to make a choice. What are we gonna be thinking about? What are we gonna be filling our mind with? What are we going to be doing with our time and energy? That's something that, is we don't take for granted when we go to sleep exactly what that choice is going to be. And often, whatever, if anyone ever sat down and made a plan for the next day, how often have you made a plan for the next day and find out the, the next day you woke up and nothing got done? Because in reality, all kinds of di different decisions have to be made. So I want to ask you a question, now that you're already at this stage in life. If you needed to make a decision about something, how would you go about making that decision? What would you do to make a decision? Feel free to raise your hand, speak up. Hmm. Does this, this mean you wouldn't make any decisions? You let other people make the decisions for you? Think about right? It. What? Think about it. You would think about it. Okay, good. So, number one is you think about it. What else would you do to be able to try to uh, figure out what to do? You're smiling, but it's, you, you must be doing something. Something's going on every moment of the day to be able to make decisions, right? You're here and you're not out somewhere else right now. Why are you here? Do you, you think that someone made the decision for you to be here? No, no one's making a decision for you to be here. You're here because you chose to be here. How did you make that decision to be here? How are you gonna make that decision to be here tomorrow? Because you are following a process, but do you know what that process is? So give me some other examples of what you could do. Let us think about it. What else could you do? Great suggestion. You could ask someone else who you believe has more wisdom than you to help you guide you in a difficult choice. Now, when you're young, your choices are kind of limited, and your experience of the complications are, re are rather limited. As you get older, you start to have much more complicated decision making process. So, for example, where should you live? None of you chose where to live, your parents decided. 
you don't even know what calculations went into the decision. Maybe they tell you like neat little stories how they ended up in a particular town, but they're probably only telling you 5% of what was in the decision-making process. So you're gonna have to make these complicated decisions. That what to learn, where to learn, what to do with your life, who to get married to, so on and so forth. Okay, so we got two. Think about it, and the other one is speak to Rob. Any other ideas? I mean, you are in yeshiva, right? You do have Svarm here? They do learn from Svarm? Okay, so what, what would you do if you wanted to know the answer to a question? Look it up. Look it up? Where would you look it up? Um, in a safer. Which yeah. safer would you look it up? Ten. Ten. Okay, but what? Ten first. Okay, so. Uh, Ten. Ten. You look in Gemara, but, but generally we look up at Shulhar, right? Because we have, where does Shulchan Aruch tell us? It tells us a lot of bottom line things. You can't really learn necessarily what to do from a Gemara. You can get some ideas, but you have to first understand what it, what's in, what you, you might think you have to look up in Shulchan Aruch. So, a common reference, Safer, you want to know what to do? Kids of Shulchan Aruch. Chai Odom. These are different from Mishnah Brura. Very brought down to a very simple level. Black and white, do this, don't do this. Right? So this is, this is something that you have access to. So, what I want to suggest is that really there's a much, much deeper process that we need to learn how to do, and we actually know how to do this, but we're not necessarily trained in how to do this. And this is a, a process that I want to share with you that we've been working on articulating because we see that people's decision-making process is deteriorating with the, with the as times go on. As times move forward, the complexity of the questions become more difficult, and people lose the ability to even know what to do. And I want to suggest that the answer is actually, the place to start is actually not in Shulchan Or, and it's not asking a rabbi, and it's not thinking about it. Because before you can actually think about something, Rabbi Eider spoke beautifully about we have the special capabilities brought from, uh, that, the, that Hashem has given us over all other animals. But we also have a neshama, we also have a direct connection with Hashem, that Hashem is able to give us guidance with wisdom. And wisdom is not merely thinking about things. Wisdom is the ability to get quiet, and to allow your mind to clear, and then be able to see what wisdom Hashem is gonna put in your mind. In fact, if you try to overthink things, you end up in a very difficult situation. Imagine, for example, you have a choice between buying two different houses, and you're gonna get into the nitty gritty details, right? This one has four stairs up the front door. This one has three stairs. Well, that's, which one's better, right? This one has bigger windows, this one has smaller windows. This one has, and then you go through, you can come up with a hundred different details about each house, and you could spend your nights and days trying to think about this. But none of it's, it's not, you're not gonna get the answer. Because at the end of the day, you don't know whether you want three steps or four steps. There's no way to know. Because right now, you're a young man. And so four steps and three steps doesn't make a difference. But when you're gonna be 75 years old, it's a lot nicer to have three steps than four steps. But how would you even know to take that into consideration? Maybe your grandparents are gonna come and visit you, and you wanna be able to welcome them to your home, and that's gonna be an issue, the number of steps. But then, if you don't have steps, and you're at ground level, the other water's gonna flood in, when it's a big rainstorm. So, there's many, many different factors. You can't just rely on your thinking process to be able to figure this out. And that's what happens, people start to figure things, try to figure things out by thinking them, and thinking them, and trying to figure out all the different details. So one of the things that I, I wanted to, uh, to distribute was a list of definitions because we all, whenever we're gonna learn something, we have to make sure that we're on the same page as, as what they are. And you mentioned Hashem, you'll get this afterwards. But just a few terms that I wanna make sure we're all on the same page about is the concept of Ruach Yisrael Saba. Ruach Yisrael Saba means the way the Jews have traditionally, the Jewish people have traditionally conducted ourselves through all generations. This is something that Yaakov Avinu, who's our grandfather, Ruach, the spirit of Yisrael, who's Yisrael? Yaakov, he's our, he's our grandfather. Saba, our grandfather. He taught us and guided us in a particular way on how to look at the world and how to conduct ourselves in the world. This is what he saw Saba. Another one is, what does it mean, L'kaim Ratzon Hashem? What does it mean to do the will of Hashem? Where would we even start to find the will of Hashem? And the answer is that we find that in Chumash. Chumash with Pirush Rashi is a place that we can open up and it's interesting, when people ask the people the question, where are you going to go? At first, someone said, pick to a rav. Someone said, look at a kavitz. It's a shulchan oruch, shulchan oruch, the machabra, the ramah. But no one said, look at chomish. The, 
where, where is Ratzon Hashem described to us? Where did Baisha Rabbeinu go to the trouble to explain to us what Ratzon Hashem was? That's in the Chumash. And with, Pirush, with the Pirush Rashi. People sometimes think, oh, I can learn. In Mikus Gedei, there's so many different fruition. But Rashi remains the Yain Shul Torah because it's giving us the simple meaning of the Psukim. Another term I want to make sure we're on the same page about, and that's called Dinim. Dinim means laws, literally. But dinim is different than halacha. Halacha means the process of trying to... You can look at a sefer halacha, and you can see, yesh armim this, yesh armim this. There's many different opinions. But the dinim is the bottom line. There's no, there's no if, ands, and buts about the dinim. There's no different opinions. The din is this. That's, a con that's another concept. Another concept I want to share with you is called shimush tamal chokhm. You spend your time learning in sefer, but what you're really doing in learning Gemara, it's really... Ma'ain and is actually an example of Shimush Talmud Chachamim. Because what you're really doing is you are sitting with Rabbi Akiva and you are learning through the lens of the people that wrote down the Gomorrah and passed down from generation to generation what Rabbi Akiva said and what he did. You are learning from him how to conduct yourself in different situations. It's not merely a, a uh, process of, of trying to grasp all the Shakalatari in, in a Gomorrah. It's about connecting to these people who are your Rebbes. The Rebbe of our time is, is Rabbi Akiva. It's, he's still our Rebbe. And Rabbi Huda Nasi is still our Rebbe. And each one of these people through the Gemara and the hundreds of people in the Gemara are recorded the lessons that they are teaching us. And that's Shemesh Talmud Chachomim. And also in our own time, about flesh and blood, you, you find the Rav, a Rosh Yeshiva, a Rosh Masifta that you want to learn from him. How does he conduct himself? And that's why we're always paying attention. How does he take three steps backwards? How does he do my machrein? How does he bench? How does he do all these little things? And we know the Gemara is filled with amazing, down-to-earth examples of the degree to which Shimush Talmud Chachamim occurs. Another concept to define is called Metzius HaDevarim. Metzius HaDevarim means the facts as they are in the world. Meaning to say, the sun is up right now, it's warm, it's providing us heat, it's providing us um, ability for plants to grow. That's a fact in the world. And there's many, many different facts that sometimes we have to understand. The Rav has to be able to understand, for example, that when a doctor tells one of the people, uh, tells someone, the doctor says, this treatment is necessary because of these test results, the Rav has to really look and see, is that the real Matthias of Devarim? And a, and a real Rav actually learns how to read the medical reports. Because he has to know that the doctor could make a mistake, the doctor could be apply old thinking. The doctor could be um, misguided. The doctor could be getting money from the pharmaceutical companies that's going to influence what kind of treatment he's recommending. The doctor could be owning a surgery center that's now going to affect him what he's going to recommend the surgery. There's many different ways that the doctor's judgment could be clouded. So a rov is now supposed to be above that level, and he's supposed to take look at the original results themselves and say, well, maybe get a second opinion. I think the doctor made a mistake over here. You don't need this treatment. You, this is a different treatment to try. Because at the end of the day, what we're going to establish today is that the Torah is what is really the real wisdom of Hashem in the world, and that's what we have to connect ourselves to. We have, some, we have many times, and particularly today, fallen into the idea that we have to listen to secular experts, even from secular experts. But the answers are always in the Torah. The guidance is always in the Torah according to the principles that we're going to discuss. And the other concept I wanted to define is Hamaisahu Iker. That at the end of all our discussions here, and all the Gabor that you're learning, and all the different Hirushim, and all the different Maforshim, at the end of the day, you have to take action in the world. You, either, you can learn about uh, a sukkah, how high it has to be or not high it has to be, but at the end of the day, you have to build a sukkah. If you just sat there and said, oh, I'm so proud, I learned the, the, the Gabor sukkah, I'm now just going to, that's it. No, that's not it. You haven't done anything. You have to build a sukkah. So you have to take action in the world. This is the key. So these concepts are now going to help us understand the process by which we are able to make good decisions at all times. Now, I want to ask you a question. Now that we've defined some terminology, I want to come up with five decisions that you want to suggest would be decisions that you want to explore today as practical decisions that you have to make, or maybe you see your friends making, and that you would like to use as an example to put through the process. So give me, give me an example of a decision that you have to make. Don't be shy. 
Because whatever decision is going to come to your mind, everyone else has to deal with the same decision making process. Base measures. Okay, what's the question? What's the decision? Where, where to go? Where to go to base measures? Yeah, okay, so base measures. Okay. Person involved. Okay, so where, which base measures to go to? Okay, great, great okay. question. Let's hear another quite decision you have to make. Someone have a pen and paper? Going to write these down for us, please. Okay, let's let's get a couple more decisions. The rabbis could speak up also, but uh, let's hear it from you guys. Decisions worth making. What's a, a complex decision that you have to make that you you want to know? You want to know how to make a good decision. And remember, this has to be. We're gonna train an idea on how to make a good decision that will carry you through your entire life. Whether it's something that's worth asking a child. Okay. How do I know whether I should ask someone else for guidance? Okay, that's question number two. Another one. Let's let's come up with two more. Well, there must be, must be a question. I mean, let me just give you an example. Do you, you have any friends that uh, maybe smoke on Shabbos? Chas No one ever heard of such a thing? All right. No. Well, the question is, how would you know that whether that's the right decision or not? Every, everything's open for discussion. How would, you, how would they know? How would you want to explain to them? It's not your question because you've already made a decision. You're not going to smoke on Shabbos, but you're going to meet up with that friend of yours. How are you going to communicate to them that they, why or they should or should not text on Shabbos or smoke on Shabbos. How would you take what you learned here as a good decision-making process and be able to communicate them, love it to them lovingly why they, your decision is a good decision for them to follow? So I just want to give that as an example because everyone's trying to be very polite over here and say, okay, you know, uh, the Rosh Hashanah is watching. But the fact of the matter is these are real life decisions that are being made, made every time. If I go into the park on Friday night to meet the, the teenagers that are out there, they're, they're making decisions. So you're obviously making a decision because I didn't see any of you there. But the Rosh Hashanah is very happy to hear that. But the fact of the matter is, everyone's making a decision process. What's going to happen? What, what they're going to do? OK. So we've got, what are, want to read back the questions? Which best measures to go to? Want to ask for guidance? And want to be in Great. OK, excellent questions. OK, good. So. The reason I wanted to bring that last example is because in the decision-making process, you have to get in touch with who you really are and what really is at stake over here to know that every, you're making decisions all the time. You can't take any decision for granted because what will happen if you don't realize how you ended up making that decision, then something later on could throw you off course and something comes up and then you're not really sure, wait, wait what, 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 am I, what am I rooted to over here? What am I grounded in? So the the first point I want to bring out is that the answer is not to start by looking at Shulchanach and the Din and Shulchanach. You know why? Why I want to suggest that? Because when you're going to do that, you can get into now an argument in your head about does this Din apply now? You ever hear people talking about a, a Din and Shulchanach? They're all arguing, does this Din apply now? Today is all discussion. Koch Nefesh, does Koch Nefesh apply? Does it not apply? All these different arguments, everyone's arguing about all these different discussions in halacha, but they're missing a step. And the first place we have to start is what I'm going to call ruach. This is the ruach Yisrael Saba. Ruach Yisrael Saba is the spirit of Yaakov Avinu, our grandfather, that he was grounded in a certainty that there's nothing besides the Shema. That's where we need to start. If you're going to get into a debate in a halacha in the Shulchan Aruch and you forgot to remind yourself there's nothing besides Hashem, then now you're, it's just a debate over words. The person is not going to come up with the right answer. In fact, uh, the, the Chazanish say, has a, a beautiful uh, little piece that says, based on Pekuch Nefesh, you can prove that it's a, it's a mitzvah to be Machal Shabbos. Because you could say, if a person doesn't close his store on Shabbos, he's not going to be able to eat. If he doesn't eat, he's not going to live, and he's going to die. So therefore, and he writes this, the person could prove that to avoid Chilul Shabbos, is that to avoid Koch Nefesh, the person could open their store on Shabbos. He shows, says this is how insane it could go, that the entire Torah could be undermined by not understanding in the first place what this is all about. 
So where do we understand the first thing, what everything's all about? We're not going to find the answer in Shulchan Aruch. Mm -hmm. The answer is in Ruach Hashem. What is the spirit of Hashem? That Hashem wants us to know that there's nothing besides Him. In all our tefillahs, all day, everything that we're saying in Tehillim, all day, we're reminding ourselves that there's nothing besides Hashem. When we see in the world, a world that there's nothing besides Hashem, now... We are grounded in that. And one, one of the things that I uh, had in the uh, my Makaris is Chayvis Olavavis. So Chayvis Olavavis is a, a safer that explains to us what are the seven requirements if you're going to be habitochen in anybody or, or anything. And he explains over the seven elements over there, which I, I'm not going to have time to go through all the things, but hopefully the, the, maybe you can make this a shir that you could teach really teaching the boys and grounding them in, the, them in, these, in these points. But the, the basic concepts are that Hashem is merciful towards all His creations. He is, he is loving you and taking care of you and with you at every instant of the day. Even if you are doing something that you read somewhere that is not what Hashem wants, He's with you. He's giving you, he's, you're existing. Hashem is giving you, lovingly creating you every moment of the day. Um, he, has the trim he has the ultimate strength to be able to do whatever he wants. So, see, I love you too, but I can't help you with most of the things you need in your life. I either don't have the money or the strength or the ability to do it. But he has the ability to take care of everything that you need taken care of. And he has been doing that from the beginning of time till now. How is that you still exist? Because you were, he took care of you when you were born. He took care of you every step of your life, and he will continue to take care of you through your entire life. This is what the Ruach Hashem is. This is what the Chayvah Salavavis is implanting us in the certainty that Hashem's providence, that He's taking care of us no matter where we are, no matter what situations we're faced with. Hashem knows everything. He's, has, he's given us everything we need and He's taking care of us. No one besides Hashem could hurt or harm us or do good for us. Rabbi Eider can say all kinds of fantastic things about me, but it doesn't, it doesn't hurt nor help me. He could say not nice things about me. But it doesn't have any impact on me. Only Hashem is going to make the decision as to what's going to happen to me. No human being could possibly impact any one of us. The only reason that we start to make decisions on whether someone is going to, we think, impact us is because we lost sight of the fact that there's nothing besides Hashem. We start to think, oh, one second. What happens if I lose a, uh, this, I lose my job, I lose a donor? Uh, the rabbi, the, the, the people leave my shul because I, they don't like what I said. All of these calculations are calculations on a very low level of thinking. The brain can take us astray because now we're thinking about things other than the fact that there's nothing besides Hashem. So how do we connect ourselves to Ruach Hashem? We first and foremost have to be settled and this is really what a Rav has to do. A Rav has to first of all, and each one of you are a Rav, in your own lives. You're, each one of you are the one who Hashem is giving the capability of being able to make these decisions and to guide yourself. What's a Rav? A Rav is a Mayor Hayra. You are guiding yourself. If you decide to sit in this shir right now instead of sneaking out the door, you are just guiding yourself. Right now you're making a decision. You're making a guidance to yourself. So the first step is then, um, oh, the other thing that the Chayvah's Love of us brings, I really could die to look and I've, I've reprinted over here. Is that Hashem is giving to you with complete generosity whether you deserve it or not. This is one of the great mistakes we fall into. We think, you know what, I didn't dive in properly this morning, things are not going to work out the way I want. I didn't do this properly. This is all figments of our imagination because Hashem is giving to us lovingly no matter what we've done, no matter what we, thoughts went through our head, He's taking care of us and everything is going to be in His providence all the time, and we don't have to be afraid of any person or anything in the world. So really, as you can see, I'm only touching on this very briefly because we have a certain amount of time set for this. But this is the foundation. If you're only going to walk away with one concept over here, is that our job is, first and foremost, whenever you face a question, you're not sure what to do, the answer is, what is the Ruh Hashem? And here's the key. The key is that Hashem is a God of abundance. He is providing abundance in the world. He is providing enough food, enough clothing, enough of everything to take care of every one of His creatures all the time. 
And even if the population of the world, and Amit Hashem it will, goes 10 times as much and 100 times as much so there's 800 billion human beings, Hashem is going to be providing for all of them. Because that's His promise to His creations. And on the alternate side is a viewpoint that makes war against this, and it's called the cult of scarcity. All the desires in the world, all the ideas in the world is that there's not enough. Every foreign idea that's a Vedazar, whether it's a political idea like Marxism and Communism, or whether it's an idea like uh, a Vedazar worshipping the sun, moon, and the stars, or uh, Christianity, and other of all the Vedazars, you can boil down to one thing, that there's not enough, and therefore, people have to be controlled, and the, and the, the, the world cannot possibly have to control all the resources to prevent everyone from having what they need because there's not enough to go around. Okay? So is you all know this from your own experience. What happens? They put out a you have Kiddush and Shul. If you think there's only one package of Rugalach, you are going to be rushing to get that package of Rugalach, Rugalach and you're gonna be afraid that you're not gonna have enough. And if there's a hundred packages and only ten of you, you're gonna know you have everything you need and you're gonna feel very calm. It's okay. Why don't you have a package? You have a package. You could have two packages, right? I'm okay. So that we have to remember this is everything we're hearing in the world, everybody is trying to convince us either to believe in the God of abundance or the cult of scarcity. You can boil every Avedazara down to this. And you can boil everything in Torah down to this one question. Do you believe in the God of abundance, which is the Kodesh Baruch Hu, who's taking care of everybody and everything all the time, creating the world from nothing, every instant? Or Chas is as a person going to get lost in their thinking and they're not sure exactly how they, they have enough money, if there's going to be enough food, is there going to be enough health? Is there going to be enough wealth? Is there going to be enough love? Is there enough time? No. That's all the cult of scarcity. So we have to make sure we're rooted in the Ruach Hashem. If you come to make a decision based on your sense that there's not enough, you're not connected to the Ruach Hashem. Because you've, your, your mind is now considering taking seriously the thoughts of the cult of scarcity, that there's not enough. So you're going to make a crooked decision based on the thought that there's not enough. If you know with absolute certainty that there's plenty, there's everything you ever needed is ready for you, you may not see it in your bank account at this moment in time, but it will be there for you when you need it, then you're going to make a completely different decision. You're going to make a decision that's based on the Ruach Hashem, that Hashem is lovingly creating this entire creation at every instant. Now if we continue to the next step, now we've got the Ruach of Hashem. Now the question is, okay, so I understand there's, Hashem is all, all encompassing, He's creating everything, He's lovingly giving us everything we need. Now what is Hashem's will? And that's where we start to open Chumash. And we, I included here, as a, as a sample, Devarim Perik Dalet, which you always have to learn, any, if anyone ever cites to you a Pusik and says, based on this Pusik you have to do something, your first answer is, let me see it in the original, let me see it with Rashi, and let me see the entire pus, the entire parak. Because what happens is people start to just quote parts of a pasuk or just one pasuk, and it's completely out of context. So one of the examples we don't really have time to go into it right now in great detail, but there's a pasuk that everyone is talking about as far as the nafshi sechem, which I was sitting in, in, in learning Chumash a few weeks ago, in parak dalit, and I said to myself, well, everyone's saying this pasuk, we have to careful, we have to close shuls and schools, and the fact of the matter is, where is this, what does this really Pasuk really mean? And it turns out that if you learn in the entire, the entire context of the entire parak, it's uh, talking about staying away from the Vedas Zara. It's, it's telling us, it's reminding us, and warning us in so many different ways that Moshe Rabbeinu is lovingly reminding us, don't believe in scarcity. Don't go after the Tamunas and after all the ideas that there's something that Hashem is somehow limited. Because that's what a tamuna is. A tamuna is a form, it's a shape. What's wrong with the Vedasar? Why not put up an image? Tell me what's wrong. Because it's limited. It's limited. No matter what you draw, no matter what you describe your favorite picture of God to be, it's limited. And Moshe Ben is telling us there's an unlimited creator, an unlimited loving creator that's giving us everything we need at all times. So he's telling us again and again that everyone in the Shvartim Ma'id and the is saying, 
if you look at the entire Pusik in the entire parrot, you'll see it's all about staying away from the Vedasar. It's all about staying away, guarding yourself spiritually, lest you should become the belief that there's not enough of something. That's what Maitre Bain is telling us. That's what he's warning us of. So that's why you have to look at the, the Psukim in context. And then if you look in the actual Gomorrah itself, the only time that this Pusik is actually brought in the Gomorrah is, and I'll bring it over here also, uh, which you should learn inside. The only time this Pusik is brought in the entire Shas is a story that he was uh, davening, and a Tsar, a governor, came along and said to him, hello, and he didn't respond. So he didn't respond. Afterwards, the governor said, you know, you sh he should be executed because he didn't show proper COVID. So th what does the governor, the non-Jewish governor, bring as proof that he was supposed to stop his davening? He brought him from the Torah. Is the pasuk that he brings one of the two pasukim he brings to prove to the yid why he should have stopped his davening, and the yid says, as we know from this, and hopefully you'll learn it after this year. But the yid says to him, "No, if I was standing, if you were standing in front of a great king and you say hello to your friend, that'd be mitzchayev mitzchayev nafshei." And so I'm standing in front of the Melch Malchi Alochem Kodesh Baruch Hu, so I can't interrupt myself to say hello to you. And you know what? The Tsar was now educated in Ruach Hashem. His Ruach, as a non-Jewish person with a nefesh, his Ruach was now elevated to see there's nothing besides Hashem. And it makes so much sense why this Jew didn't interrupt his tefillahs. And so it says that then the, the, the Chassid Echad, he goes to his house in peace because he, two types of peace, one is the governor didn't do anything to him, and number two is he was at peace inside because he lived in integrity what he believed and what he was saying all along, that he doesn't have to be afraid of anybody. And he was able to withstand the, the temptation to fall into the Geisha thinking about the Psukim. It was the non-Jew who was using the Psukim to try to convince him to stop his davening. So this is an example, if you have Ruach Hashem, and you know Hashem is taking care of you and providing everything you need, and now you look at the Psukim, Ratzon Hashem, you're seeing Hashem is telling you, make sure you don't fall into the traps of a Zora and start thinking after other foreign ideas. Now, after that, how do we know what to do? We look at Dinim. Then now we will first open the Shulchan Aruch. Because why do we now look at the Shulchan Aruch? Because the Shulchan Aruch is telling something black and white. And we can see what the bottom line is. But in order to know how to apply the Dinim, we first have to, next, next thing we have to do after we open it up and understand what it says in Shulchan Aruch, now we have to go back to the Shemesh Tamid Dechachamim. This is where we get the nuances. This is where we learn the Gemara. We start to learn all the different ways in which the Dinam are understood and explained. So now we can understand how to apply it to a particular situation. Because the Dinam in Shulchan Aruch are very limited. It's black and white, bullet points. In order to understand the whole context of how to apply it in real life, you have to understand the entire, you have to understand the nuances. That's what's brought in the Gemara, which is again Shemesh Tomei Dechachomim. How does my Rav, my Rav is Rabbi Akiva, my Rav is Rabbi Yehuda Nasi. These are my these are my Rabbanim. And you could look at how Rabbi Chaim Brisker looked, did things, and you could read uh, 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 how how uh, Chaim Voloshinov did things. They, it, they're all our Rabbanim. These are all the people that we look to to see Shemesh Tomei Dechachomim. How did they respond in this situation? How did they respond to this question? We start to hear stories. We start to hear examples of, and look at their writings and details. We start to see many, many different aspects of this. Now, after we've taken this counsel, and that, by the way, to your question about asking a Rav, a question, this is the point to which you bring the Rav into the question. Because you've already got the Ruch Hashem, you've already got the Ratzon Hashem, you've got the Dinim, and now you want to know how to apply it. Now you're going to ask Shemosh Talmi de Chachom. You're going to ask him, can you please help me understand this? Here's what I think it means, but can you help me clarify that? And that's where you bring the Rav into the situation. Now, then you have the Metzius of Devarim. This is the reality. Now, you, now you look in the world. Until now, we haven't looked in the outside world. What's happening in the outside world until now is totally irrelevant. You know why? Because we know that there's nothing besides Hashem. He's lovingly providing for us. There's enough of everything. If you start with the idea, you look outside in the world and you see, I don't, I don't see any food on the store shelf. I think there's scarcity. 
you started. You don't know how to. You don't know how to understand that until you first start with ruach, ratzon, dinim, and the shimush tamad the nuances. Then you can do mitzias of divarim. Now, once you now know the. Actually, we're going to take a few minutes to apply this to the three questions we have. But now we take a decision, decisive action. Now we go to Maiso Iker. Because all this has been talked until now. Now we have to make a decision. Am I going to daven? Am I going here? Am I going to do this? What is the right thing to do? Now we have the tools to make a decision. And there is that we could have many, many different uh, uh, examples brought of how decision making, we have to bring it into decisive action. Because after you made a decision, you can still be afraid because if the Ruach Hashem hasn't permeated you to know there's nothing to be afraid of, that there's really nothing to be afraid of, you still be not sure if you want to actually do it. And that's where you need to take decisive action. And Hashem will guide you to being mitzliach. Hashem will guide you into action, taking that action, and He'll show you the way, things that you cannot possibly understand until you actually take the action. And there's a concept in Torah that through taking action, you could refine your understanding of the Torah a thousandfold. Because when you're just learning Torah and you're not taking action and doing and taking decisive action, it's all still stuck in your head. When you take decisive action, all of a sudden you start to understand what it really means. So let's take our three questions. What's the first question? Okay. So here's how I like to suggest that you make a decision like that. And I think you'll all guess what I'm going to start with. Ruach Hashem. There's nothing besides Hashem. Hashem is lovingly taking care of us. He's providing everything we need. And when we have a good, loving teacher, that's part of the love of Hashem. So the question you're going to ask yourself is, which Masifta has the Ruach Hashem? Which Masifta? It's not the number of Bachram there. It's not what it's going to look like on your resume. It's not even where your friends are going. You could lead your friends to, come, to make the right choice because now you know how to explain it. But who is going to train you and open your eyes to Ruach Yisrael Sama? That's the, really, the real question. At the end of the day, if a person learns this entire Gemara and can tell you all the taste was Baal but doesn't have Ruach Yisrael Sama, then is that where you want to go? You want to go to a place that's going to give you Ruach Yisrael Sama. It's going to follow Ratzon Hashem, that's grounded in the will of Hashem, that follows Shulchan Oruch, that the dinim are taken seriously, that learns the Gemara like these are your Rebbe's, that are actually alive. Every one of the people in this Gemara is alive right now. We are, they're living through us. We're their Talmudim. And by the way, I have news for you, that the, what's in the Gemara is only a fraction of, a tiny, tiny fraction of the discussions that they had in Beis Medrash. What you're meant to do when you learn the Gemara is to realize there's a lot more that's in the blank spaces around the Gemara. The whole context, the whole understanding, the whole libu kaverim, the whole atmosphere, the whole ruach yisol saba is, is it's just giving you a few words in a discussion. The member that says in five words something that's really thousands of hours of discussion. So now we're going to go. Now we went. So we took care of, of the dinner. We now uh, um, concept of. Now, what's the reality? Okay, let's call up the let's call up our friend. Let's call up the Rosh Hashiva. What's what? Ask him questions. Maybe it's through your parents, but you're now old enough to make your own uh, inquiries. What's it like over there? What's the ruach of the Bachum? Are the Bachum people that really take this with love and, and t- are grounded in this, or are they kind of like waiting until Shir is over so they can go check their cell phones, right? Which they're also good people, but they're, they're just, they're, a little bit, they're not realizing the importance of this. They're going now to, what's on their cell phones? The cell phones is 99.9% all about the scarcity. How this is not enough and this is going wrong and all this kind of stuff. It's filling a person's head with the very opposite of Ruch Yisrael Saba. People think the problem with the, the media is the things that are not sneers. The, the problem is the, th- the idea that there's not enough in the world. That's an even greater problem than the not sneers. Because it's filling a person's head with thinking, oh, now I really know what's going on. There's not enough in the world. There's not enough room for the people. There's not enough food for the people. There's not enough air for the people. There's not enough water for the people. There's not enough health for the people. There's not enough health care for the people. 
There's not enough all, love for the people, not enough time, not enough money. These are all the lies of this cult of scarcity. So if you're spending your time reading the newspaper at night, that's what you're filling your head with. And if you don't know how to read the headlines to see how they're lying to us and trying to hide that there's a God of abundance, then a person is going to now start absorbing that and thinking that's the reality. And then finally, in this case, we have to make a decision of decisive action. So the decision is yours and only yours to make. The fact that your good chabra over here has decided that for him it's more important, a different calculation, is irrelevant to you. What's the, best, what's the most important thing to you? And then you take decisive action and you register yourself for the masifta, you register yourself for the school, and you are now attending. Now what's the second question? When to, who, sorry? when to ask for when guidance. When to ask for guidance. So in that case, when to ask for guidance, I think I've already answered that question. You need to be first established in Ruach Hashem, Ratzon Hashem, and the Dinim. And I'll tell you why. Because how are you going to know if the person you're asking for guidance is going to give you good guidance or not? Just because a person has a black hat and a long beard, doesn't mean that at that moment in time he is, he is really grounded in Ruach Hashem. Maybe he's feeling nervous about something or feeling concerned about something. Maybe he's taking other calculations into his mind. So you need to know what Ruach Hashem is to be able to find among your friends who's the guy you can talk to. Find among your Rebbeim. Who's the guy, who's the Rav, who's the Rosh Hashiva who, who's really grounded in this and sees Hashem's love in the world, sees Hashem's abundance in the world. Okay, what's the third question? Why not do your Chalashah? Why not do your Chalashah? So, now we go back to the really the fundamental point over here. What's the role of Hashem in this case? Hashem is all capable. He is providing everything we need at all time. There's never a lack of anything. What does He come along and He says, I want to teach my children an example of how to live this out in real life. And that means a one day a week, we rest from all our attempts to try to make the world work out the way we want. One day a week, we stop trying to get involved in the nitty-gritty details. Remember I said the nitty-gritty details are going to get you lost? How many? Four steps, three steps? That's what we do all week. Who should I call? How do I get the product to the person? How, how All these things are constant dilemmas and, and debates all week. Is that we're trying to figure out what to do and how to run the world. Of course, as partners with Hashem, but we are thinking about it the world in, in the Gashistic part of the world. Hashem comes along and He says, I'm giving you a gift. The gift is you could be like me, says Hashem. I transcend all these things. At the end of the day, it doesn't really matter if you have three steps or four steps. The fact of the matter is, Shabbos is a gift to take us to a place of Yom Shekul and Menucha. What's the Menucha? The Menucha is there's no more internal debate. So the Chayvus of Lovavas tells us the greatest form of happiness for a human being is when he's in a place of Menucha. When he doesn't have all these debates and all these fears because he knows Hashem's taking care of us. What's Shabbos? Shabbos is a day, a 24, 25 hour experience of going to the, the hot baths of Hashem's love. I'm allowed to stop thinking about all these things. In fact, I'm encouraged to stop thinking about these things. In fact, what does it say? When Mashiach comes to Yom Shekulei Shabbos. That's what the real reality is. In Gan Eden, they weren't thinking about all these kind of things. They weren't thinking about, is there going to be enough money? Is there going to be, are the meteors going to hurt the earth? Is there going to be run out of space for the garbage? All these kind of things, that wasn't their calculations. They knew Hashem was taking care of every single thing, and they were in a place of absolute menucha. That's what Mashiach looks like. And that's what Shabbos is. So that's why Shabbos is in Yenin Rafua. Because why do we get sick? The only reason we get sick is when we're mentally stressed. We're mentally stressed. Of, we get mental illnesses and physical illness from the stress. Someone who comes down with a cold is a person who's under stress. And he's not sleeping properly. He's not eating properly. You know why he's not sleeping and eating properly? Because he's too stressed to sleep and eat. It's not something going around all of a sudden. Boom, he got hit by a cold. No, one second. He could be on a desert island and got a cold. Because he was, all his thinking was dragging him down. 
and he and he's just tired and exhausted and, and, and he keeps pushing himself because he's afraid that if he stops to go take a nap and have a bowl of chicken soup or take a hot bath, whatever's gonna be good for him, he's afraid that he's he's gonna miss something. He's gotta be checking the news all the time. He's gonna be have to always be on top of things. And then what happens? He gets sick. And then sicker and sicker, and then heart problems develop, and the list problems develop, and causes all these different types of problems. If you look at the at some core of all these health problems, it's from stress, stressful thinking that you're taking seriously. So what is the what is the chayvus levav is coming and telling us? He said you don't have to go down that way. And you know what Shabbos is? Shabbos is a prepackaged experience of manuka. You come along and you turn off your cell phone. I don't have to know what the president said. I don't have to know what my aunt said. I don't have to know anything about anybody. All I have to be is present in this moment. I want to have, if someone smokes a cigarette during the week, I'm not recommending it, but let's say someone smokes a cigarette during the week, comes a day when the Abishter says, this process of lighting a fire is a very human experience of trying to control the world, trying to change the world so that it'll serve me. And on Shabbos, you can't do that. I can't light the match, and I can't get the light lit the cigarette from somebody else. So not smoking a cigarette on Shabbos is part of the gift of Shabbos to I can experience what it means to com be completely enveloped in a time of peace, a time of serenity. And then I'm going to make my choices around that. So I'm going to make sure every everything flows from this, you see? Now at the Shabbos table, what do I want to talk about at the Shabbos table? Do I want to talk about the same things we talk about all week? Just gets me agitated, this one says that, and do you know what this presidential candidate said? You know, I'm not having an a, a experience of being relaxed. How many of you ever had like a really relaxed experience where you go to like some beautiful country place and you're like lying on the grass and you see the, the clouds moving across the sky and you don't have to think about the pressures of your people? Friends, you have to think about the pressure of your parents, the pressures of the masifta, where you're going. That's manucha. That's Hashem's gift. And that's what Shabbos is. So Shabbos comes along, we get to turn all those things off. Now you see why we're being encouraged and why I have to remind myself to keep Shabbos. Because when you get into the world and you see you have to make the parnasa, oh my gosh, wouldn't it make sense to work another day? Seven days instead of six? No comes to Torah. Hashem says, no, 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 no. You're missing the point. The whole point of working six days is to be able to create an environment that's going to be connected to me. And so I'm giving you an opportunity to disconnect from all that on the Shabbos. And this is your gift to yourself to become connected to that. So all these forms that we're talking about, we have here, we have the Masechtas and the Gemara. We have the Dinam and Shulchan. They're all coming to direct us in that direction, in that place of Manucha. So when you know that you're being taken care of, you don't need to work on Shabbos. You don't need to know what's going on in Shabbos. You could sit there. I was interested. I was sitting with my kids uh, a couple years ago. It was an interesting experience. Sitting, we have a swing on our front porch. And, um, you know, everything today is, well, we've got to do something. Right? We've got to do something, we've got to do something, we've got to do something. What are we doing next? Right? What's, what's going to happen after this year? What's going on? What's going to be happening? Everyone's got something to do. So my two boys, my two older boys, are sitting down on the swing with me, and we're walking. I'm just like enjoying this experience. I'm enjoying the clouds. I'm enjoying the trees. And so my kids say to me, Tati, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? So first, I don't know what to say to them. I wasn't planning to do anything. I said, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? we're going to learn to do nothing. We're going to learn to enjoy each other's company and to enjoy the experience of Hashem taking care of us. And that's what life is meant to be. Elamai, we're in Golis, so we have to deal with certain things. We have to make a parnasa. We have to get through certain things in life. But in reality, we have to learn how to get back to the place to know that everything is being taken care of um, for us. And that's what Shabbos is. So that's your answer to yourself. If you're wondering why not to text on Shabbos. Because it's a gift to you from Hashem to have a time when you don't have to text. And the same thing is for your friends. If your friend is smoking on Shabbos, if he's, if he's texting on Shabbos, or whatever else he's doing on Shabbos, you can lovingly explain to him, 
let me give you a different understanding, appreciation of what Shabbos is. It's a gift for your, your soul, it's a gift for your mind, it's a gift for your body to, con to connect with who you really are. Which is, you know, interesting. We're not called human, we're called human beings. We're not called human doers. We, we have all these fantastic skills. We can build things, we can use computers, we've got cameras, we've got all these fantastic things we can build and do. But that's not what we're called, we're not called human doers, we're called human beings. Because when we get down to what we're meant to be, it's just be. And that's the ultimate fulfillment of a human being, is the ability to be present with himself, present with his creator, with the Abishter, present with his family members, with his spouse and with his children, with his chaverim. And that's what our gift is, to go and reach and, and talk to anyone who we have the opportunity to, to share with them this gift. And my suggestion to you is that a mitzvah Hashem, the, the, the Rosh Yeshiva, will take these makaris and really delve into them. I think this is a gift for the, the entire Talmudim, for life, to really understand what's Ruach Hashem, what's Ratzon Hashem, what are, well, how do we make decisions? How do we make decisions in difficult times? Because what are difficult times? Difficult times are just the appearance of all kinds of things swirling around that we can't figure out what the right thing to do is. We just run from one side in our heads to the next. And what are you, excuse me, what are you gonna do? What are you doing? Everyone's running around in a chaos trying to figure out what everyone else is doing. No one's, everyone stops thinking for themselves because their minds are overwhelmed. So my suggestion to you is that if you take these six steps of first the Ruach Hashem, the Ratzin Hashem, the Dinam, the Shemesh Tamadei Chachomim, the Metziyas Devarim, and the making a decision and taking decisive action. If you take those and inculcate those six steps into your life, you will have the ability to make always the right decision in every situation, in every place, and every time for your entire lives. And you'll be able to pass it on to your children that they will always have the ability to make the, a good decision. And the good decision is gonna to come to be gifted to you. When, you. when you follow this process, Hashem is gonna open your eyes. Like I said before, it's not about the thinking. It's about being open and receptive to what Hashem is gifting us, His guidance. That is available to you at any minute, at every instant. And this is meant to guide you to see that it's possible for you to always make the, the good decisions for yourselves. I can't tell you what the decision is. I won't be there with you in every situation, every time, and every place, but there is the Avish still will be there with you at every time and every place and every decision. And as soon as you, if you made a a, a compromise and you, you made a, a, a short-sighted decision because you were rushed and you lost track of these things, you can always go back. That's what Shuva is. Shuva is always returning back to these six principles. Returning to Ruach Hashem. What's the Ratzon Hashem? And what you did until that second is, is gone and done with. Now, you can heal anything, you can repair anything because now you're in the infinite loving kindness of the Abishter, that he is giving you everything you need every minute. He'll repair whatever damage you might have caused in a bad decision. You never have to fear that. You are always being taken care of, and you always have the resources inside of you, and with the good teachers and good examples, you'll always be able to make the good decisions throughout your entire life. So, Mitzvah Shem, right now the times of the Sarasmei Chuba, this is the Indian. The Indian is to recognize this, and recognize the gift that we have. So, I'm open for questions if everyone has them, or if, uh, um, you said that that pleasure of the and Rosh Hashanah is not going on help. So at the end of the day, after that whole gemara that, that you said, is it at the end of the day it's not going on your help? It's going on a Zara and Morpheus. So that's that's the pasuk shot of the pasuk, and the pasuk never leaves that shot. There are different, there are different. This is why you have to start at the beginning and at the highest level because there are different. Um, Dinim that will refer to this Pasuk and say, okay, you know, you, you see on the back of the cereal boxes, make sure to you know, wear a helmet when you're riding a bicycle. And they're trying to apply this simple concept and saying, take care of yourself. But the real reason you take care of your body is to be a vessel to serve for the Ruchnias. The real reason that you make sure that you drink properly and that you don't put, and you wear a helmet is only in order, in, in order to support the Ruchnias. We're not the Greeks that the body and the health of the body becomes an Aveda Zara itself, that that becomes the ideal. Today everyone's running around checking their weight, their temperature, their, their uh, body mass index, their, uh, someone that was telling me today he, he checks his metabolic age. I mean, th the numbers they're keeping track of, you have whole apps on the phones that are keeping track of everything, how many steps you took, how many stairs you climbed. 
that's Greek. That, that's a Greek of the Zohar that our bodies become the emphasis and how they look and how strong we are and all these kind of things. So the answer is that at the end of the day, you will discover when you understand what the Pasuk really means in its, in its source, you take care of your ruchnis. You take care of staying away from the scarcity mentality. You will see that it's good for your ruchnis to take care of your body. And, but that's a take saw of it. And if you put the body first, then the ruchness is lost, and the body also gets lost. We don't have time to get into that, but I can prove uh, from examples how when a person puts their body first and their gashmias first, then they lose the ruchness, and in the end of the day, they lose their, they lose their, their gashmias. Because they're living in a world of stress, they're living, living in a world of limitation and fear. And if you're stuck in fear, then, then the, the gashmias also crumbles. So that's, that's my suggestion on that. And, and you can, oh, by the way, I'm not, anything I'm saying, I'm not saying you should take my word for it. I'm encouraging you to look at the Pasuk, look in the original Perak and Chumash, see what Moshe Rabbeinu is conveying, look at the Rashi, look at the Gemara, and, and, you'll, and, and see for yourself, see what, where Hashem leads you in discovering what, that, what Hashem is really speaking to you about. Okay. And is it, so is it wrong to say that a person shouldn't do X, Y, Z, something dangerous because of the Mishra that I'm not to Is it wrong to say that? So, I say somebody gets up and says, you, you have to go to shul, you have to, you can't do this, it's too dangerous, which I don't understand. Okay, that so in that, in that case, a person that has to look at them and go through and start from the Ruach Hashem, that Hashem is taking care of us all. What's the Ratzon Hashem? He wants us to be being fruitful and multiplied. Puru Hu is a fundamental part of Ratzon Hashem. He wants us to be fulfilling, fulfilling the world with people. And we have to know the dinam. The dinam is that we get together and we dive in as people. Right? And we have to understand the nuances. We see over here a, a Maisel B'chosidah that I just quoted from Brochus, that he didn't stop his davening just because the governor wanted, to, warned him to, wanted him to. Even at the threat of losing his life, he was willing to give up his life not for, uh, he was willing to give up his life for even one fila. And it turned out that when he stood up for what was right, the governor left him alone because the governor was impressed by him. So you start to see, before we even get to look at what the, the facts are in terms of whether there's a danger or not, we see that we have a completely different perspective. That even if they're coming at us and saying, you gotta close the shuls, the answer is, but based on, on understanding of Hashem, is I am pr praying to the God of all creation. I'm praying for my benefit and for your benefit, Mr. Governor. And this is what we're gonna continue to do because this is the right thing to do. I'm not afraid of you and I have a Gomorrah to prove it. Now, and, and by the way, that Pusik was used by the governor, not by the Pusik. The governor used that Pusik to try to stop the dying. Now, what's the real Matthias of Devarim? Is there really a Sakana on the level that would require and be helped or to be necessary to close a shul? Is that something that's even possible? Is there a greater Sakana? As, as the Rosh Hashiva in Patterson Shlita has been saying that the greater Sakana is closing the shul. And he brings proof from, from, from uh, Maisa Bilam and brings proof from the Gemaras on that. So now you have to look at the whole Matthias of Devarim. Closing a shul. So let's say you have a, a certain percentage chance that there could be something spread around. But on the other hand, you have a 100% chance of, of a spiritual damage, of a ruchnistic damage. And the Shemart of the is saying, don't damage yourself spiritually. And sending everyone home to be isolated is a tremendous spiritual, mental, emotional, and physical damage to people. And to the chinoch, and to the, all of Yiddish trade, and to the whole world. And leads to people starving and people out of work and food disruptions, massive, massive chaos on a much greater level, which puts everyone in a much greater sakana than whatever the original sakana was. That's what the Metzias of Devarim is. Plus, if you understand that the kavana of the people at the, at the levels that are trying to manipulate everyone into fear is to take control of their lives, which will be a Rahman al Islam, is a war against Puru then you realize, one second, let's go back to the top. The first thing is, Ruch Hashem, he wants us to have children. And if they're gonna come back, and they're gonna come and use all these control methods to, methods to stop people from having children, Rahman then we know it's not the right thing to do. No matter, it's not about how deadly a particular uh, thing might be, or what, the, what the, um, the, the, the Sakana is, it's about seeing the entire picture. That's why you have to know the Metzius of Devarim, you have to look at the entire Metzius of Devarim. I think what Moshe is asking is, would you say that, includes also in relation to physical health or it's unrelated at all? So, it, 
first of all, it's a ruchnistic thing because the physical health comes from the ruchnis. That's number one. Rak yishmalocha, which is another pasuk, which comes a few sukkim um, before that. The the kliyakar says that the ma'id is on the um, the ma'id is on the ruchnis, and the secondary is the health of the of the goof. So even in the, the this two pesukim that I brought, and there is an emphasis, the real emphasis of the Torah, and also look at the context, is on the Ruchnis. It's not on the Gashmis. The Gashmis, like I said before, is, is a servant to the Ruchnis. That's what a Yid is about. A Yid says, my Gashmis is a cleave to help me do Torah mitzvahs. But it does not come at the expense of being Mavat of Torah mitzvahs. That's something that the Torah does not tell us to do, because it goes against the Ruach of Hashem. Yisrael, Ruach Yisrael Tzavah. It goes against the Ratzon Hashem, the clear Psukim. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Any here? I was going to take some, it's taken physical, when the Kisses are it's taken physical, it can have a physical also? With the physical effect? Yes. So Hashem, Hashem does take care of us, but it also, like, there has to be a Maiso Iker. You have to take action. So Hashem wants to provide us a Parnassah. There's enough money in the world for you and everything that you will ever need. Now, if you decide that you're going to stay in that chair for the rest of your life, the fact of the matter is you're probably going to be fine because your friends are going to bring you dinner and they'll bring you water and, and you'll probably still be basically taken care of, but you're not necessarily going to have the life for the potential that you want it to be. And so therefore you need to get out of your chair and you need to then go learn, uh, either you're going to teach Torah or you're going to learn a, a skill and you're going to make that parnasa, right? So we're meant in this world to do something. That's why the Maiso Ikka, that's why, it's very interesting, a Molek tried to stop the Yidin from getting the Torah on Harsina. But after the Torah came into the world, they weren't successful, they tried to stop the Yidin from bringing everything they learned in Torah into the actual Maiso Ikka, to taking Maiso. To, to do, to do, to take action. So, you, we all need to take action. But we have to remember the action has to be guided by the ruchnis. Okay, so I'll just give you an example. So I have a, I, I practice law. I have a client that I believe the, he got himself in a situation was based on an inappropriate type of action. He misled the bank as to how much debt he really had. So, we had a discussion about it and my understanding was that he was going to pay that bank that he had lied to about how much he owed to them, how much he owed everybody. The bank would never have lent him the money if he, they knew that he owed so many tens of millions of dollars. So he lied, and they gave him the money. Now, I, am a, I as a lawyer, my parnasa is, the, is dependent on Hashem, number one, and there have to be clients that like my services and want to pay for my work in defending them against different types of lawsuits, right? So sometimes a bank is suing them for money. So if a person filled out all the paperwork honestly and did everything possible to uh, make money in his business and his business had a bad turn and now he can't pay for the bank, the bank is suing him, I think it's a legitimate use of my time and energy to now help that person defend himself against the bank that he shouldn't lose his house, he shouldn't have his whole business collapse and work out terms with the bank that will be fair to everybody. But if a person lied in the outset, and he said he only has $5 million of debt, and he really had $27 million of debt, then he cheated the bank in getting the money in the first place. So I don't want to participate in helping him try to get the bank that he owes $2 million to to, to accept only $300,000. I feel that's dishonest, because the bank would never give him the money if he, gave, if he, if he told the truth. So I feel that he has to, morally, he has to pay bank, back the bank 100% of what he bore, because he bore it under false pretenses. It's not, it's not like just the business, you know, part of business that things don't always work out. This was an actual lie. So, I, I thought he was going to pay the whole the bank back, and we started representing him, and I had to tell him, listen, I don't feel comfortable representing you in this case anymore. So this client is a very big client of ours. Let's say, just to put it in numbers, I mean, within a year and a half, he paid us $400,000 in, in revenue for the business, okay? So this is a significant part of our revenue. So my question is, what's the right thing to do? There's a lot of lawyers, including some that would, would daven and shul and daven three times a day that would say, you know what, someone else is gonna represent him, I wasn't involved in the original lies, all these uh, kind of that they'll still do the business. 
But I feel that the ruchnis is, I'm coming here and giving you a sheer on doing things honestly. If I'm helping someone facilitate a fraud in a bank, then there's something lacking in me. And the whole parnasa I'm getting from this guy is really, it's a crooked parnasa. So I don't know where my next client is coming from. I gave up this guy. He's not, I'm not representing on that matter anymore. And he's going to obviously drop me on all the other cases too. So it goes back to the Ruach Hashem. So I'm taking a shtadlus, I'm showing up for work. But I'm also not just saying, okay, well, I got this client. I got to do whatever he says to do. So every moment of a shtadlus is going to be, we're going to be checking against the same decision making process. And it actually, this is, this is what I used. What's Ruach Hashem? I have everything I need. Hashem is going to provide me. He didn't put me in this world to help someone perpetrate a fraud and be dishonest. And we see Sukkim that support that, Ratzon Hashem, and the Dinim, and the, and the uh, Shemesh Tanadei Chachomim. We see the extreme honesty of our, our, our Chachomim and our Rebbe's and Rebbeim and Rebbeim. That's the example I want to follow. So now I made a decision that, I, that in the short term, I'm going to lose money from. And I can tell you other stories of that. I was, I'll just tell you a quick story just to understand the, the importance of these concepts. Because so many people, many of you will go into business, not necessarily all going to play Kredish, but if you're going to go into business, which is also a mitzvah, you know, finance your families, um, there's so many pressures to do all these tricks and tricks of the trade, so to speak, and they end off creating a tremendous hill of Hashem. And that's why, going back to, to the question earlier, we can, there's no such thing as a hill of Hashem from doing a mitzvah. If you make a shul and you make a minion, there is no such thing as a chil l'shem. It's not, that's, that's not a halach, that's not a Torah concept. If you look in the Rambam and, and, and the whole concept of a chil l'shem, it's actually a person who's a Talmud Chacham, a person who's not conducting himself properly. And when you're, if you, when you're doing a mitzvah, you, it's impossible that you would be causing a chil l'shem. So where do we, where do chil l'shems get created? Because a person's making all kinds of chashbanis in their head. Cutting corners, cutting corners, cutting corners. That's where we get into trouble. Then it gets in the front page of the newspaper that so-and-so didn't pay his taxes. So-and-so wrote the wrong information on the bank application form. So we have to make our hashtadlus, but our hashtadlus has to be guided by the Ruach Hashem. That each decision we make, do I want to take this client on or not, is guided by all these six steps over here, by these six principles. We answered your question, by the way, when you were gone. But oh, no. So, Baruch Hashem, thank you very much for the opportunity to present this to you. Any questions? Yeah. Isn't the reason of keeping Shabbos not, not, not this far behind it, but like that Hashem gave it to us out of Sinai? Like, accepted it? Well, that is, that is the nice of Anishma. That is the, that is the Kabbalah's oil that we do things that we don't even understand. But the fact of the matter is that Hashem has gifted us, and most of the mitzvahs to be able to understand why this is important to us and why it's a benefit to us. So, we might as well grasp that and enjoy the understanding of it. It's both. If, right, at the end of the day, what you don't understand, but, but still, I wanted to say that on this point, the Indian of Kabbalah's oil, you still have to have Ruch Hashem. You have to understand, you're not just following a rule book that just, you know, someone put in front of you. You're following, because it's coming from the creator of the entire world. He's the one that wrote this all this down for us. So therefore, it makes sense to follow, because he's the all-knowing creator, who created us, creating us every second lovingly. So therefore, I'll follow his instructions, even though I don't understand them. Okay, inshallah, good morning, see you on And uh, I'll see you on your wonderful life. <laughs> <laughs>